name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with Dear brothers and sisters, let us call to mind our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You are sent to heal the contrite of heart, Lord have mercy. To call sinners to repentance, Christ have mercy. You plead for us at the Father's right hand, Lord have mercy. God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to the Father. Forever. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Glory to God, glory to God, Son of the Father. O God, who teach us that you abide in hearts that are just and true, grant that we may be so fashioned by your grace as to become a dwelling pleasing to you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the patched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited sort land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. It's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream 
and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of God. For it does not cease to bear fruit. The word of the Lord. Responsorial Psalm. Our response is, bless the man who has placed his trust in the Lord. Bless the man who has placed his trust in the Lord. Bless the man who has placed his trust in the Lord. Bless the man who has placed his trust in the Lord. Blessed indeed is the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the path with sinners, nor abides in the company of scorners, but whose delight is the law of the Lord, and who ponders his law day and night. He is like a tree that is planted beside the flowing waters, that eats its fruit in due season, and whose leaves shall never fade, and all that he does shall prosper. Not so are the wicked, not so. For they, like winnowed sharp, shall be driven away by the wind. For the Lord knows the way of the just, and the way of the wicked will perish. Bless the man who has placed his trust in the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The word of the Lord. Rejoice and leap for joy, says the Lord. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. Be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, Jesus came down with the twelve and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples, 
and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you, poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you, and cast out your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you that are full now, for you shall hunger. Woe to you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions. Question one. What does it mean to be in a community where there's no difference between the rich and the poor? What will that be like? What would it feel like? Question two. The Beatitudes teach that we are blessed for what we are, not for what we have or will have. What does that mean to you? Question three. How are your blessings and giftedness a call to be connected to your community? Question four. What is the connection between the first and gospel readings today? What implications do they have for you? as a person? And what do they teach Nigerians who say they must make it by any means? Yes, Dr. Helen. Father, let me attempt question number four. No, number three. How are my blessings and giftedness called to be connected to my community? Father, my blessings and giftedness are not about me and are not for me. God blesses you so that you bless others. God, God blesses me. you so that you bless others. Yes, so that Father. through you, the blessings will get to others. To others. Okay? So you find that when you are blessed and you keep it to yourself, you don't find happiness. So that, you know, the sermon... Is, is that your personal experience? Yes, it's my personal experience. That when you are blessed yes. and you keep it to yourself, yourself, there's no joy in it. There's no joy in it at all, Father. Let me give you this example. Father, I like um, fried yam. Fried, I, fried, fried yam? Yes. With which oil? Red or... <laughs> Father, with red oil. Okay. And um, there's a special species from Benue that is very tasty. And in those days... Benue yam? Yes, Benue yam. Okay. And um, in those days, when somebody is coming, when I'm eating it, I feel so offended. And sometimes I even hide the yam, tell them, take it to the kitchen. And because it's Benue yam so scarce that... Uh, no, it, it, it's just that you don't want to share it because it's so good. Okay. But when the people leave, 
Father, you don't enjoy it again. Okay. You, you don't enjoy it again. So you ask, why didn't I share with you know the people who came? Yeah, so when yes. they leave, yes. there's a feeling that comes upon you and what is left as you are eating it, you yes. no longer yeah, enjoy it. Yeah, you no longer it. enjoy it okay. and so on. And your giftedness, you know, we are given gifts. You know, some of us give to preach, give to smile at people and so on. And when you smile and you see the other person smiling, gives you joy and so on. Your riches, if you keep to yourself. I had a horrible experience last night. Um, there's a boy who has a wound in the church here, and he came, okay, I did something, and then he said I was supposed to do something again, and I didn't. And on Friday when I was praying, I said, no child of God should go through the pain the boy is going through. And I was supposed to reach out, and I didn't. And when I slept, God gave me a dream. I, went, I felt pain in my leg. I felt as if I had a wound. And I was screaming in my sleep. Calling for help. Yes, Father. And that told me that I owe it to that guy. So whatever you have is not for you. When you keep it for you, it makes you uncomfortable. It's for your community. It's, I tell people my age that this is a payback time for us. God has been generous to us. Find a school, go and teach uh, civil studies. Find a school, go and teach them English. Find a school, go and teach them about life in general. So that shows that when you keep what you have to yourself, it doesn't bring you joy, it doesn't bring you satisfaction. Yeah, so when you keep what you have to yourself, it does not give you satisfaction. And then she said, what you have is not your own. Please take note of that. What you have is not your own. It is given to you in trust. Okay, you can enjoy the euphoria of being the custodian, but it is not for you. Let's put our hands together for her. Okay, Emmanuel. I want to answer question two. Question two. Okay. The Beatitudes teach that we are blessed for what we are, not for what we have or will have. It's teaching us that the Beatitudes are more, Jesus is more concerned on what we are towards people, how kind we are, how we share with people, and not what we have towards what we have. Let's say not the riches that we have, not the fame that we have. He cares more about what is inside. Okay, so not about what we have. He cares more about what is inside, right? Yes. Let's put our hands together for him. And the people who are usually happy, those who are rich, Jesus tells them woe to them. Not necessarily because they have done anything wrong. Just because like in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, they refuse to help those. The story of Lazarus wrong. and the rich man. Okay. Yeah. So, so Jesus tells them woes today, not necessarily because of what they have. But because but they refuse because to of, do something for those who did not Because have. they refuse to do something for others. Just like what Dr. Helen has said. Let's put our hands together for him. Um, let's hear from you. Um, Solomon, right? I'd like to add to question number two that Emmanuel has answered. Okay. Uh, the B attitude. What is the B attitude? It talks about our attitude as Christians. What is, what is the, uh, what our conduct? It's a God's our relationship with our brothers and sisters. It's not so much about what we possess, but what we have, about our position, material wealth, about intelligence, about our beauty, and so on and so forth. It's about our lifestyle. Does our lifestyle portray what we say we are? It's about our conduct as Christians, about our attitude. It's not so much about what we have or what we will possess in the nearest future but it's more about our daily conduct in our life, in our dealings with our brothers and sisters, in our relationship, be it at home, at work, wherever we find ourselves as Christians. So Christ is telling us this, this morning, as it were, from the gospel, that it is our attitude that matters, not what we possess, not whether or not you are 
a chief or a high chief or whatever. But what is important for us as Christians is our attitude and our interaction, our relationship with our brothers and sisters, not so much about our possession, either now or in the nearest future. And okay. so the Beatitude really is, it should serve as our, as our guide. For us okay. Christians, the Beatitude is our roadmap in our journey of salvation. Thank you. Thank so um, you are saying that what people have or what we have, I mean, let's, let's do that now as a personal thing. What we have as a people is not exactly what makes us who we are. So we are differentiating between who we are and what we have. And the Beatitudes bring that out very, very clearly. So, and I like the point you made about relationship, the attitudes that we exude from us, coming from us onto other people. Unfortunately, um, in our culture, we live in a society that there is so much attention that is given to what I have than what I am. Let's put our hands together for him. Um, Raj, there's one. I would like to attempt question four. It says, what is the connection between the first and gospel readings? What implications do they have for you? What do they teach Nigerians who say they must make it by any means? Now, the connection between the first and the second um, and the gospel reading, one is that the end of those who trust in their riches, who trust in the arms of flesh, is curse and woes. Because in the first trading, say, curse is the man who trusts in man. And Christ says, woe to you when people, you know, say, speak good things about you, when people do things, when people hail you. So for those who have placed their trust in physical things, in material things, in the applaud of men, their end is definitely not a good one. Now, the second thing is that Christ, the, the, the first reading says, blessed is he who places his trust in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. And the Bible says that he's going to flourish, not because he places in trust in himself, but because his trust is in the Lord. Even if he has nothing? Yes. So and even if he has nothing, just trusting in the Lord, he is blessed? Yes. Is that, is that true? Yes. That you are just able to trust in God, you are blessed even if you have nothing? Yes. Will that go down well with many people? <laughs> but and it's true. Yes. Okay. And you know, when, when I read that question, what came to me is, is what Jesus Christ said after he gave the parable of, you know, the rich man and Lazarus. He said, because a man's life consists not in the abundance of things that he owns, but in his relationship with God. In a his... man's life consists not in what he has, yes. but in his relationship, in his with, relationship God. with other people, in his trust in God. God. In God. And so that's how the first reading and the second reading connect because when Christ was talking about the Beatitudes, he was talking about those of you that are poor, those of you that mourn, those of you that cry. These are people who honestly believe and trust in God and he says they are, they are blessed. Now what implications do they have for me personally is that um, I cannot place my trust on physical things. The Bible says that the arms of flesh will fail. If I want to live a life that flourishes, if I want to live a life that, you know, the, the first reason says that even you will not be afraid of drought, you will not be afraid of dry season, that your leaves will always be green and you will always bear fruit. Because the one who trusts Trust. in the Lord lives in the moment. Yes. He's not afraid of tomorrow. Tomorrow. Because tomorrow is in the hands of God. Of God. So, so for me, my, uh, it's, it's for me to... Place more trust in God is a call for me to place my focus on God and not to be bothered about future things. Because those who really place their trust on the material things, they are moved and distracted by everything that happens because they feel like if the, the stock falls down, their money falls down, you know, all those things. But when and their you, value decreases yes, as human beings. Yes, their value decreases. Now, what does it teach to Nigerians who say they must make it by all means? It tells them that... Um, 
their end is actually going to be perilous. It's going to be woe. If they decide that regardless of what God teaches, regardless of the principles of God, they want to make it and make money by all means. Is it, the Bible says money is like a spirit. It will fly away. At the end of the day, that money, they really wouldn't enjoy it because we see the end of those who have tried that. We see that they don't have peace. They don't have joy. Some of them commit suicide. Some of them get on into all kinds of things. So it really teaches that what you have is not what gives satisfaction. It's not what gives life. So we should really place our trust in God and depend on him. Thank you. Thank you. Let's put our hands together for her. Let's hear from Ebenezer. I want to attempt question number one. Father, life is a paradise in a community where there is no difference between the rich and When the poor. there's no difference between the rich and, and the, the poor, poor life, life is what? Is paradise. Paradise. Yes, Father, because... Okay, uh, quotable quote from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Father, because it takes courage even for the poor to approach the rich as it is now. And it takes courage for the rich too to accept the poor's um, encroachment. Uh, because um, the rich is suspicious that perhaps this person that is coming that's looking so poor might harm me in one way or the other. So it creates fear. And that is not the original plan of God. Is that fear justified? No. Think about that. Is that fear justified? Is it? From the teaching of Father George, Father, in this question you asked, I found out that fear is... Your experience, is that fear justified? Not really, no. I've come across situations where, even in my lowly state, uh, some few individuals approach me for help. And I, I do the help, and uh, I, I do not sustain any kind so, of hurt. So that kind of fear is, is fueled by, our most of the time, our impression about what's happening in society. Not so much with regards to the person who is seeking help. You know? So that fear exists, no doubt. We accept that. But it is not necessarily because of the poor. It is because of the impression that our society gives about the insecurity and then about the person you are helping somebody and then the person now becomes totally dependent on you. So those kinds of fears exist. But then, like what we have been talking about, the one who trusts in God, who knows that his protection is God, will not look at any kind of hindrance before doing good. Because we were created to do good. Even if we are going to die by doing the good. I would rather die doing good than refraining from it and still die. Well, I've had situations where I, I did good, like you said, and I got uh, the negative in return. It's normal. From the same person, I, I, I try it's, to It's a normal to. thing. But I, was, I was just saying that must not be a discouragement because yes. we have an ultimate ro role to play, ultimate goal that we are going for. And if I get before God and I begin to give excuses based on the fear of my society, God would tell me something I wouldn't want to hear. But when that happened, my experience was that God compensated me for the good I did, even though I got uh, a negative response or result. Now, Father, um, 19, year 2010. Just, before, just before you go on, do you, do you really know that, I mean, I want, I want to ask, you know, when you do something that is good, many people are disturbed when there's no appreciation. They feel like he is ungrateful when there is no appreciation from the person to whom you have done some good, right? Why do you feel that way? How grateful have we been to the one who has given us those things and made us custodians of those things? 
So, if just going by what Dr. Helen said, if you are just a custodian through whom these things should reach others, what is it your business that you gave it to them and they did not say thank you? I mean, this is deep spiritual reflection that you see yourself as just a pipe. A pipe through which the blessings of God reach other people. When they say thank you, there's a good feeling from it that you have done something. But when they do not say thank you, you should actually have a greater good feeling. You should have a greater good feeling that the person did not say thank you. Because that person who didn't say thank you is actually helping you to realize your role in the world. When somebody says thank you, the tendency is for you to begin to think that it is you that is giving it to the person. When the person doesn't say thank you, you should say thank God for using this man to remind me of what exactly I am, a channel. So, Father, um, we went uh, with Father George to Germany. He was part of the journey in uh, the year 2010. And when I got there, what I observed was that there was no difference between the, the rich and the poor, like the question. In the sense that, from the Where appearance, was that? Sir, Germany. In Germany? Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess the, the, their wealth was equitable, I mean, equitably distributed. They still have rich and poor there. They have. They okay. have. Okay. But no, there, there was no there difference. There was no difference. Because as we were moving around Germany and meeting people, their footwear to their clothes, down to virtually everything about them, you can you can differentiate. You cannot see somebody going with tattered rags or dirty uniform and slippers that are eating off, and automatically you know that this is an identity card for the poor. <laughs> All you see in Germany is everybody were happy, and as we were going, there, there was no burglary proof, no fence. We're seeing, in fact, there are provision shops where you can see, where, uh, basically glass shops where you can see through. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it off from there. The truth about that is that we have a culture that is not helping us. There is so much emphasis placed on wealth, appearance, what I have how better I can appear more than when Christians begin to forget that you are called and your call is to compare yourselves not to any other human being but to Jesus. The comparison we are called to make is between ourselves and Jesus. And every human being who does that comparison successfully with Jesus will bow his head or her head in shame. We raise our shoulders most times because perhaps we have done some comparison between myself and the one God has raised me higher than. That's the reason for pride. That's the reason for arrogance because we think that we are there. But that arrogance will diffuse and disappear if for that moment you think Am I behaving like Jesus? And every Christian must know that that is what we are called to do every day. So when for a moment you feel proud of anything, please quickly call yourself back to order. Am I comparing myself with the right person? After all, he told us, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Not as your neighbor is perfect. Not as even your priest is perfect. Not as your pope is perfect. As who? As your heavenly father. So until we get to that point, what are we arrogant about? What are we proud of? Okay. I would like us to um, go ahead now. Is there any question that has not been answered? Okay. Today, as we read about the Beatitudes, 
Luke's Sermon on the Mount, or Sermon on the Plain, and Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. They all begin with a series of Beatitudes. In the Beatitudes, you know, in Matthew, you have eight Beatitudes. Blessed are they, eight of them. But then in Luke, you have four Beatitudes and four curses, or four woes. Now, with the Beatitude, Jesus turns upside down the accepted standards of the world. So what people hold as the ultimate, Jesus discredits. And what we have discredited, Jesus calls blessed. So the people Jesus called blessed, the world would call wretched. And the people he called wretched, the world would call blessed. The Catechism of the Catholic Church describes the Beatitudes in these words. It says, the Beatitudes are at the heart of Jesus' preaching. They take up the promises made to the chosen people since Abraham. And then take note of the next sentence. The Beatitudes fulfill those promises by ordering them no longer merely to the possession of a territory, but to the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes fulfill the promises by ordering them no longer merely to the possession of a territory, but to the kingdom of heaven. And that summarizes all that we are going to talk about today. There is a difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old set of blessings and the new set of blessings. Those old set of blessings are referred to as causes in the new covenant. Moses had a list, a list of his own beatitudes. And I'll just go through them. Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is what he said. And if you obey the voice of the Lord, your God, being careful to do all his commandments which I command you this day, the Lord, your God, will set you high above the nations of the earth. I am better than others. That's the blessing there. I am better than others. I am higher than others. That's the blessing. Next one, in verse 2, he says, If you obey the Lord your God, you will experience all these blessings. And then he went on to list them one after the other. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds, flocks, will be blessed. Your fruit baskets, your bread boards will be blessed. Whatever you, where, wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction, but they will scatter from you in seven. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. Then verse 11 says, The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock, and abundant crops. Those were the blessings of the old covenant. And he didn't stop there. Just like the gospel we took today, Jesus gave a list of blessings, four of them, and also gave a list of uh, curses or woes, four of them. Moses continued by bringing up a list of Curses, which are a direct opposite of the blessings. But if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, 
Then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Your towns and your fields will be cursed. Your fruits, baskets, and breadboards will be cursed. Your children and your crops will be cursed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be cursed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be cursed. Direct opposite, right? Of the blessing. And then he said, the Lord himself will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in everything you do. Until at last, you are completely destroyed for doing evil and abandoning me. And like I said, these are blessings and curses of the old covenant which Jesus has come to obtain. Look at the list. The old covenant blessings are all earthbound. All of them. Having children, abundance of food and property, success and prosperity in life, protection from enemies, possessing the land of promise, and being first among others. They will take us nowhere than here, where we are. These are all earthly. And all these were seen as signs of God's blessings for those who obeyed God. Now I want us to take a look at that list. Are they good? Are they good? They are good. But they belong to the old covenant. Aren't these the same reasons why so many people are distressed today? So many people are going through psychological hardships because they don't have these things. And when we have a culture like we do in our country that values so much what people have, what do you expect? When people are put under pressure by their culture, by their family, by the society, because they don't have this, what do you expect? Today, we are talking so much about our young people who are just ready to do anything. As long as they make it. What are they making? They say, fake it until you make it. I say, what are they making? You go ahead and do horrendous evils. As people are even saying that they are being involved now in some kinds of rituals in order to get money. How do you manage when you get your money through not just dubious but diabolical means and then you get that money, having thrown away your peace of mind. How do you want to enjoy that? It is bad enough that the things people kill themselves for today are the things of the old covenant. And when I say people, I mean Christians. Because many of those people that we see all over social media doing different kinds of things, many of them don't bear Mohammed. They bear Christian names from Christian homes. So we are failing. We are failing. What we have sold to our younger generation as value is warped. Unfortunately, that is where their attention is. Or is it about having children that young couples who are still struggling to see how they can live together and manage themselves are already under pressure. Year one goes, year two goes, year three goes. Ah, no child, year three goes, year four goes, just like that. No child. Unfortunately, Christians are part of this. People of the new covenant are bearing people of the new covenant while practicing the old covenant. 
And Christians today, many of them, even Catholics, are ready to do anything just to get pregnant. Just anything. Including disregarding the teachings of the church with regards to conception. So we ask ourselves, what are the values that are guiding the life we live as people of the new covenant? What are those values? So it's a big problem that we have on our hands. And the change can begin from here. When we begin to reorientate ourselves and correct our distorted thinking about what truly gives meaning to life. Like Urachi was saying, so many people that our young people are looking up to and saying, oh, this is a model, oh, has this or had that. Many of them are not happy. I tell young people, especially those who are looking up to getting married, and they are so worried, and I say, this mar and you hear them say, once I get married, I will be happy. Now I'm seeing married people laughing. It means something, right? They never knew anything. Once I get married, I'll be happy. But the truth is, look at those who are married and see how happy they are. So these things, these things that Jesus disregards are the things that we are killing ourselves for. And I said, they are earthbound. When we are out of this place, they don't go with us. So, with the coming of Jesus, the earthbound blessings in the old covenant are the curses in the new covenant. And the curses in the old covenant are the heaven-bound blessings in the new covenant. So the things people are running after are things of the old covenant. Not having them is what Jesus calls blessed. Whereas earthly blessings are dangerous precisely because they are earthly and often compete with God for our attention, in the new covenant, the way to build treasure in heaven is through the earthly causes. Poverty, hunger, mourning, and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. It is not the Lord will destroy your enemies for you. Jesus says, blessed are you when you are persecuted. The poor and hungry are blessed because they recognize their dependence on God. They rely on divine providence. They are blessed for God never forgets the needy and the hope of all the afflicted shall not perish forever. Psalm 9 verse 18. Mourning. Separation from God because of sin causes mourning in our soul that is too deep for words. Unfortunately, with such emptiness and pain, like we said, many often try to self-medicate through distraction, vain pursuit of pleasure, or even drugs. These are wrong ways to feel that emptiness inside us. The morning, or true morning, brings about repentance, contrition, humility, and an enduring consciousness of our dependence on God. That is the morning Jesus is talking about. True morning comes when we realize how short we fall from God's glory. We should mourn. That's why I said if we compare ourselves to the person we are called to compare ourselves to, we will bow our heads in shame. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. That's what Paul says. The mourners also include those who are resigned to the will of God despite the difficulties and challenges they encounter. Those who have lost loved ones. 
the burden of caring for the sick, and the humiliation of childlessness. These are burdens that people carry, and they can truly mourn over them. To them, the Lord promises eternal happiness regardless of their present circumstances. Persecution. And the persecuted are those who stand for faith with heroic convictions. Those who stand for the truth, even when it is not fashionable to do so. We know what that means in our society. Those who suffer insults, calumny, and violence for living out their Christian beliefs and values. These are the persecuted. And they are promised in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, where the Lord says, If you stand for me, you acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge you before my heavenly Father. That's why they are blessed. Woe to the rich. Because it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to go into the kingdom of heaven. So woe to them. Because where their treasure is, there also will their hearts be. That's why Jesus says, woe. Riches are not evil. And when we have them, they come from God. But they have the potential to drag our attention from God to earthly good. That's what Jesus is warning about. Those with full tummy. Those who laugh now. When laughter, now laughter is not about um, don't laugh. Jesus is not saying so. As a matter of fact, you can't have a Christian who is also gloomy. That will be a contradiction in terms. Because Christianity is about joy. So when Jesus is saying, woe to those who laugh now, when laughter is rooted in earthly joy and pleasure, when it distracts from evil and the injustices that are around us, when we become insensitive because of laughter to these evils, when it distracts from the goodness of the kingdom of God, and when we miss out, of God's kingdom on account of our earthly joy and pleasure, what follows is mourning. This is what Jesus means. Those who laugh, you shall mourn. When people speak well of you, and I say, beware of flattery and praise singing, they give a false self-esteem and make you feel better than you actually are. Reputation before men is nothing before God. So we should actually be conscious of what kind of reputation we have before God. Now, the world celebrates falsehood, not truth. When it celebrates you, beware. Because all have sinned in the eyes of God fallen short of God's glory. So when the world is saying you are better than others, beware. Flattery and gossip are one, one thing. They go hand in hand. The first one tells you how great you are, flattery. And the second one tells you how lousy others are in comparison to you. Proverbs 27 verse 6 tells us, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. So when people speak well of you, remember some of these things. How blessings become a cause. In the wake of blessing, temptations often become irresistible. Spiritual defenses are often weakened. Discipline is often neglected. And pride is often fed fat and stoked. So when we have, we raise our shoulders. Suffering, on the other hand, raises our defenses. We become vigilant. It brings us 
to our knees. Humility. It disabuses us of self-reliance. You don't even have anything. So why are you thinking that you can do anything for yourself? The only option you have is to rely on God. Suffering removes the luster of earthly pleasures and indulgences. Pride receives the blessings of God as something earned and deserved. It inflames arrogance and cuddles false sense of security. That's pride. On the other hand, humility sees any progress, provision, or success for what it really is, a gift. For a person can receive nothing unless it is given him from heaven. Self-reliance receives the blessings of God as proof of its own strength and ability. It does not take credit only. It also boasts in the blessing that he has been given. What do you have that was not given to you, that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Self-indulgence receives the blessing of God as a warrant for selfishness instead of love. The self-indulgent sees his whole world as a means of fulfilling his own cravings. He takes advantage of his influence to serve himself. Scripture says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Vain glory receives the blessings of God and bows to self-worship. It gloats to self over achievements, over possessions, over good deeds. And even when they speak well, they gloat over it. But those who are conscious of grace will gladly sing. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give the glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Against the spirit of our time, which exalts wealth, power, glamour, and influence, our Lord commends humility, meekness, mercy, purity, generosity, and detachment. These are the new values of the new covenant. The Beatitudes are the spiritual autobiography of Jesus himself because he lived it to the very end. The Beatitude is a list of Christian ethics. They are a series of holy meditations that reveal the heart of God. This is what God wants us to do. And the Beatitudes reveal that. They are a set of mystical keys that help us to enter into the mind of God. Because they reveal to us. They tell us the things that please God. The Beatitudes teach that spiritual happiness will entail persecution including physical, mental, and social ramifications. Persecution. But the transitory nature of life and its problems, nothing stays here forever. Because of that nature, the transitory nature of the earth and its problems, they are nothing compared to the eschatological hope that Jesus is teaching in the gospel today. Reward is great in heaven. It is we who, can, who have to live out these values. Angels are not going to come down from heaven to live it for us. It is we. So I ask a few questions as we wrap up. Will you take the easy way which yields immediate pleasure and profit or will you take the hard way which yields immediate toil and suffering? I wish that many of our young people would ask themselves this question. Because the easy way is not necessarily the right way. Even though they say in Nigeria, the straight way is not the fastest. Uh, the 
Kona Kona is the fastest and perhaps the shortest. <laughs> but the straight one is not, is not. Will you seize on the pleasure and the profit of the moment? Or are you willing to look ahead and sacrifice them for the greater good? Which would be your choice? Will you concentrate on the world's rewards? Or will you concentrate on Christ? Which one? Because he has come to upturn the values, the things that we hold dear. They are the things he says, woe to you, because these things can lead you astray. If you don't have them, they're better for you. Because you'll be spared of those temptations. Will you be happy in the world's way? Or the way of Christ? Which one? And the truth is, there's no way we can be part of the dispensation of Jesus in heaven if we are not part of the new covenant he has enacted on earth. What leads us to that great reward is our faithfulness to the covenant, the new covenant on earth. Scripture passages for our reflection. The Beatitudes, the eight of them we have in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Obsession with wealth, Matthew chapter 19, verse 22. 1 Timothy 6 and Proverbs 11, obsession with wealth. Affliction prepares us for glory, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17. Godly sorrows produce repentance. Godly sorrows produce repentance. That's what Jesus meant by blessed are those who mourn because they have realized their need for God. And then Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 2 says, Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. One reminds you of your dependence on God. The other is likely to make you forget. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for sending Jesus to lead us, he who, he who he is himself the way, to lead us on that way to you. We pray today that the blessings that will make us forget you, may we not have them. And grant us what we need that we may not also go stealing as to bring discredit to you. Grant that all those who are in one need or the other, here in our church and all over the world, may experience your special intervention Amen. through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us rise and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father of all, maker of heaven and earth. Of all things visible and invisible, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, not in not made, but substantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who 
was spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. Amen. Brothers and sisters, having reflected on the fact that those who trust in the Lord are like a tree planted beside the flowing waters, let us now turn to him with prayers for ourselves, for the world, and for our troubled country, Nigeria, knowing that he who is merciful and gracious will hear and answer us. We pray for the Holy Father, Pope Francis, for the bishops, for Christian leaders everywhere and at all levels, that they may always strive to be, cred to be credible witnesses of Jesus' kingdom values before a world addicted to power, wealth, and pleasure. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord hear our for all believers, all our leaders, and aspiring leaders in our country, including Christians, that they may show greater commitment to reducing poverty and unemployment and promoting fundament the fundamental dignity of everyone in our society. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord hear our for all those whose lives are dogged with failure, for the sick, for the poor, the unemployed, for marriages in crisis, and for those who are suffering daily and struggling with loneliness and rejection. May the Lord intervene in their lives today and transform their circumstances unto good. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord hear our prayers. For the many young people in Nigeria today who are in the desperation to get rich, weak, and by any means, who are turning to crime, engaging in all manner of internet fraud and are alleged to be performing sadistic demonic money rituals. May their eyes soon be open to the fact that it profits nothing for a man to gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the success of the evangelization and leadership development programs of Luke's Terra Leadership Foundation and for the intentions of its partners and benefactors. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Brothers and sisters, the Lord hears us whenever we call him. Let us now take a moment and present our intentions to him. We pray with Mary, the help of Christians, as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, you love us, and your love surpasses all our hopes and desires. Forgive our failings, keep us in your peace, and lead us in the path of eternal life. We ask this through Christ our Lord.
Let us pray, brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May this oblation, O Lord, we pray, cleanse and renew us, and may it become for those who do your will the source of eternal reward, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right and just. it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so with all the angels we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Holy. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. A mystery of faith. For so, the cross and the resurrection, you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis our Pope, Ignatius our Bishop, Anselm his auxiliary, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. 
as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We now offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy to be under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that all who believe in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Let us pray. Having fed upon these heavenly delights, we pray, O Lord, that we may always long for that food by which we truly live. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the blessing of the Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. The Mass is ended. Let us go in the peace of Christ. <laughs>